Greetings, thanks, and congratulations to the Kenyans graduating class of 2005. There are these two young fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way, who nods at them and says, morning boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit, and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, what the hell is water? What the hell is water? This is a standard requirement of U.S. commencement speeches, the deployment of didactic little parable-ish story. The story thing turns out to be one of the better, less bullshitty conventions of the genre. But if you're worried that I plan to present myself here as the wise older fish explaining what water is to you younger fish, please don't be. I am not the wise old fish. The point of the fish story is merely that the most obvious, important realities are often the ones that are hardest to see and talk about. Stated as an English sentence, of course, this is just a banal platitude. But the fact is that in the day-to-day -day trenches of adult existence, banal platitudes can have a life or death importance. Or so I wish to suggest to you on this dry and lovely morning. What the hell is water? 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 Of course, the main requirement of speeches like this is that I'm supposed to talk about your liberal arts education's meaning. To try to explain why the degree you're about to receive has actual human value instead of just a material payoff. So let's talk about the single most pervasive cliche in the commencement speech genre which is that a liberal arts education is not so much about filling you up with knowledge as it is about, quote, teaching you how to think. think. If you're like me as a student, you've never liked hearing this, and you tend to feel a bit insulted by the claim that you've needed anybody to teach you how to think, since the fact that you even got admitted to a college this good seems like proof that you already know how to think. it's you that the liberal arts cliche turns out not to be insulting at all because the really significant education in thinking that we're supposed to get in a place like this isn't really about the capacity to think but rather about the choice of what to think about if your total freedom of choice regarding what to think about seems too obvious to waste time discussing I'd ask you to think about fish and water and to bracket for just a few minutes your skepticism about the value of the totally obvious. Okay, so 
So here's a problem. There's a big problem here. The problem is, it's true. You're oppressed, 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 you're oppressed. God only knows why. You're oppressed, 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 you're oppressed. Maybe you're too short or you're not as beautiful as you could be, or your grandparent was a surf. Likely, because almost everybody's great grandparent was. You know, and you're not as smart as you could be, and you have a sick relative, and you have your own physical problem. Frankly, you're a mess. Frankly, you're a mess. And you're oppressed in every possible way, including your ancestry and your biology. So the entire sum of human history has conspired to produce victimized you with all your individual pathological problems. It's like, yes!
and I can think about how our children's children will despise us for wasting all the future's fuel and probably screwing up the climate, and how spoiled and stupid and selfish and disgusting we all are, and how modern consumer society just sucks, and so on and so forth. You get the idea. If I choose to think this way in the store and on the freeway, fine. Lots of us do. Except thinking this way tends to be so easy and automatic that it doesn't have to be a choice. It is my natural default setting. It's the automatic way that I experience the boring, frustrating, crowded parts of adult life when I'm operating on the automatic, unconscious belief that I am the center of the world and that my immediate needs and feelings are what should determine the world's priorities. The thing is that, of course, there are totally different ways to think about these kinds of situations. In this traffic, all these vehicles stuck and idling in my way, it's not impossible that some of these people in SUVs have been in horrible auto accidents in the past and now find driving so terrifying that their therapist has all but ordered them to get a huge, heavy SUV so they can feel safe enough to drive. Or that the Hummer that just cut me off is maybe being driven by a father whose little child is hurt or sick in the seat next to him and he's trying to get this kid to the hospital. And he's in a way bigger, more legitimate hurry than I am. It is actually I who am in his way. Or I can choose to force myself to consider the likelihood that everyone else in the supermarket's checkout line is just as bored and frustrated as I am. And that some of these people probably have much harder, more tedious or painful lives than I do. Again, please don't think I'm giving you moral advice or that I'm saying you're supposed to think this way or that anyone expects you to just automatically do it. Because it's hard. It takes will and effort. Do it. Because it's hard. It takes will and effort. And if you were like me, some days you won't be able to do it, or you just flat out won't want to. But most days, if you're aware enough to give yourself a choice, you can choose to look differently at this fat, dead-eyed, over-made-up lady who just screamed at her kid in the checkout line. Maybe she's not usually like this. Maybe she's been up three straight nights holding the hand of her husband who's dying of bone cancer. Or maybe this very lady is the low-wage clerk at the motor vehicle department who just yesterday helped your spouse resolve a horrific, infuriating red tape problem through some small act of bureaucratic kindness. Of course, none of this is likely, but it's also not impossible. It just depends what you want to consider. If you're automatically sure that you know what reality is and who and what is really important, if you want to operate on your default setting, then you, like me, probably won't consider possibilities that aren't annoying and miserable and miserable but if you really learn how to think how to pay attention then you will know you have other options do it because it's hard it takes will and effort Because it's hard. 
It takes will and effort. It will actually be within your power to experience a crowded, hot, slow, consumer hell type situation as not only meaningful, but sacred. On fire with the same force that lit the stars. Love, fellowship, the mystical oneness of all things deep down. On fire with the same force that lit the stars. Love, fellowship, the mystical oneness of all things deep down. Not that that mystical stuff's necessarily true. The only thing that's capital T true is that you get to decide how you're going to try to see it. On fire with the same force that lit the stars. Love, fellowship, the mystical oneness of all things deep down. On fire with the same force that lit the stars. Love, fellowship, the mystical oneness of all things deep down. I read a lot about terrible things that people have done to each other. You just cannot even imagine it. It's so awful. So you don't want to be someone like that. Now, do you have a reason to be? Yes, you have lots of reasons to be. God, there's reasons to be resentful about your existence. Everyone you know is going to die. You too. And there's going to be a fair bit of pain along the way. And lots of it's going to be unfair. It's like, yeah. No wonder you're resentful. It's like, act it out. See what happens. You make everything you're complaining about infinitely worse. There's this idea that hell is a bottomless pit. And that's because no matter how bad it is, some stupid son of a bitch like you could figure out a way to make it a lot worse. what life is like. It's suffering. That's what the religious people have always said. Life is suffering. Yes. Life is suffering. Yes. Try to reduce it. Start with yourself. What good are you? Get yourself together for Christ's sake so that when your father dies, you're not whining away in the corner and you can help plan the funeral and you can stand up solidly so that people can rely on you. That's better. Don't be a damn victim. Of course you're a victim. Jesus, obviously, put yourself together. You know how to do that. You know what's wrong with you, if you'll admit it. 
you know there's a few things you could like polish up a little bit that you might even be able to manage in your insufficient present condition. And so you might shine yourself up a little bit and then your eyes will be a little more open then you can shine yourself up a little bit more and then maybe you could bring your family together instead of having to be the hateful, fightful, neurotic, infighting bats that you're doomed to spend Christmas with. Life is suffering. Yes. Life is suffering. Yes. So then you fix yourself up a little bit, kind of humbly, because, you know, God, you're a fixer-upper if there ever was one. And then you got to figure out how to make peace with your idiot brother, and probably not, because he's just as dumb as you, so how the hell are you going to manage that? So then maybe you get somewhere that way and your family sort of functioning and you find out that kind of relieves a little bit of suffering, although it reduced the opportunities for spiteful revenge and that's kind of a pain in the neck. And so then you get your family together a little bit and you're a little clued in then, at least a bit, because you've done something difficult that's actually difficult. You're a little wiser and so then maybe you could put a tentative finger out beyond the family and try to change some little thing without wrecking it. Our society is complex, and we teach our students that they can just fix it. It's like, go fix a military helicopter and see how far you get with that. You're like a chimp with a wrench. Whack! Oh, look! It's better! It's like, no! It's not better. Things are complicated, and to fix things is really hard. And you have to be like that golden tool to fix things and you're not and that's the other message of the west how do you overcome the suffering of life be a better person life is suffering yes life is suffering that's hard it takes responsibility and I think you know if you said to someone you want to have a meaningful life everything you do matters that's the definition of a meaningful life but everything you do matters you're gonna to have to carry that with you or do you want to just forget about the whole meaning thing and then you don't have any responsibility because who the hell cares and you can wander through life doing whatever you want gratifying impulsive desires for how useful that's going to be. And you're stuck in meaninglessness, but you don't have any responsibility. Which one do you want? Well, ask yourself, which one are you pursuing? And you'll find very rapidly that it isn't the majority of your soul that's pursuing the whole meaning thing, because, well, look what you have to do to do that. You have to take on the fact that life is suffering. You have to put yourself together in the face of that. Well, that's hard. Christ, it's amazing people can even do it. I'm stunned every day when I go outside, and it isn't a riot. With everything burning.
Here's some more. Use your despair to find freedom. Use your despair to find freedom. Use your sadness, loneliness, depression, and despair to buy your freedom. Do you know how to do that? Do you, and by the way, freedom feels really good. Here's how. Do you remember that day you were lonely and uh, sad and neurotic and anxious and depressed? and every other bad feeling in the world. And if only you could talk to that guy or that girl, the, the person of your affection. If you feel like you're gonna die anyway, just do it. You're free. Go up to that person that you think is gonna turn you down. And guess what, they probably will. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter. Everybody's failing all over the world all the time. Go up to that person and say to yourself, before you walk up, my whole life is garbage right now. I'm sad, I'm lonely, I'm neurotic. Let's mix it up a little bit. Let's shake the box. Let's just see what happens. Leave your box, walk directly up to that person that is way better than you in your broken mind. They're not way better than you, but you think they are. And say, you know, I just wondered if you'd like to go out to dinner with me. I think it'd be fun. Use your despair to find freedom. Use your despair to find freedom. Use your sadness. despair to buy your freedom. one of these events with my friend, Josh. And we walked in and we looked around and we said to ourselves, hmm, not exactly the most attractive room. I don't want to be unkind, but it wasn't exactly what we were hoping for, with one exception. Across the room, there was one unusually attractive woman, and she sort of stood out as the most attractive woman in the entire place. And so I said to my friend, well, this is a disaster. We wasted our night. I'm just going to go over to the most attractive woman in the room. I'll flame out in about a second and a half. And then we'll be done. And we just go home. So I walked directly up to the most attractive woman in the room. And she was my girlfriend for 11 months.
asked me what were my odds, I would have said pretty close to zero. Pretty close to zero. And it turns out that other people were intimidated and didn't talk to her. <laughs> now, why was I able to walk up to someone that I could normally not walk up to? Is because I'd given up. I had absolutely given up. There was nothing for me here. I just said, well, doesn't matter. Yeah, I don't know her. If she turns me down, nothing lost. The moment you realize that your despair is your freedom, you're free. the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, 
Shall he not? Much more. Clothe you. A ye of little faith. Much more. Clothe you. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Those are famous lines. That's sort of Christ the hippie. Right? It's like, hey, let it all hang out, do your thing, and everything will come to you. But that's seriously not the proper interpretation, because there's a kicker with this. And the kicker is this. For your heavenly Father knows you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. O ye of little faith. ideas that I've ever encountered. If you configure your life so that what you are genuinely doing is aiming at the highest possible good, then the things that you need to survive and to thrive on a day-to-day -day basis will deliver themselves to you. If you dare to do the most difficult thing that you can conceptualize, your life will work out better than it will if you do anything else. Well, how are you going to find out if that's true? There's no way you're going to find out whether or not that's true unless you do it. You have to be all in in this game. 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 A oh, ye of little faith. A oh, ye of little faith. A oh, ye of little faith. A oh, ye of little People say things like, I do this in a kind of self-deprecating way. Well, I've been lucky in this, that. And you know very well that a lot of life is luck. Akira. But then a lot of it is, and it's underplayed. Do you also work hard? I realized some time ago that, because I'm born in Britain, I, I have that natural tendency to like underplay so they go, well, I'm just lucky in that. And somebody said to me, you shouldn't do that. You do work very hard and I thought yes but saying what well, I've been lucky in that is a nice way to say to other people oh I haven't really had input and you don't need to particularly I it's a flattering thing to say to somebody else which ignores one full phrase of Branch Ricky I came across luck is the 
residue of design. Luck is the residue of design. Luck is the residue of design. A lot of what we call luck, it has come about through something other than chance. I used to say, you're lucky to be born in America. And on one level, that's true, which is like, you could have been born in, in the great pool, things you could have been born in Mogadishu, and it'd be a lot worse. But there's also something it covers up, which is the luck is that people before you made good choices that meant that you are in a situation which is more optimal. And it's not simply luck that you have in America the right to freedom of speech. Luck is the residue of design. Luck is the residue of design. It's the consequence of men and women making good decisions. Men and women making good decisions. Luck is the residue of design. Luck is the residue of design. We have to find a better way to understand what we often mean by luck. You have luck in your life, sometimes because other people have made good judgments that are effectively for you before your time. Your politicians, your family and others. It's not just, it's not just some wild whirly game. It's also make prudent decisions, make wise decisions, work hard a lot more and you'll find that you are what we call lucky or luckier don't do any of that stuff put everything off all the time be lazy unmotivated blame other people all the time for things that think you could correct yourself and you will find you are the type of person that is described as unlucky luck is the residue of design Luck is the residue of design. It's the consequence of men and women making good decisions. Men and women making good decisions. Luck is the residue of design. Luck is the residue of design. One of the very great things that C.G. Jung contributed to mankind's understanding was the concept of the shadow. That everybody has a shadow. And that the main task of the psychotherapist is to do what he called to integrate the evil. To, as it were, put the devil in us, in its proper function. Because you see, it's always the devil, the unacknowledged one, the outcast, the scapegoat, the bastard, the bad guy. You 
majesty, the black sheep of the family. It's always from that point, what we could call the fly in the ointment, you see, that generation comes. In other words, uh, in the same way as in the drama, to have the play, it's necessary to introduce a villain. It's necessary to introduce a certain element of trouble. So in the whole scheme of life, there has to be the shadow. The shadow. The bastard, the bad guy, the black sheep of the family. The shadow. Integrate the evil. In integrate the evil. The shadow. The bastard, the bad guy, the black sheep of the family. The shadow. Everybody has a shadow because without the shadow, the county is up. So this is why there is a very strange association between crime and all naughty things and holiness. Now you see, holiness is way beyond being good. Good people aren't necessarily holy people. A holy person is one who is whole, who has, as it were, reconciled his offices. And so there's always something slightly scary about holy people. And other people react to them in very strange ways. They can't make up their minds whether they're saints or devils. So holy people have, throughout history, always created a great deal of trouble, along with their creative results. Take Jesus, for example. The trouble that Jesus created is absolutely incalculable. Think of the Crusades, the Inquisition, the heaven only knows what's gone on in the name of Jesus. Freud's a big troublemaker, as well as a great healer, you see, it all goes together. The shadow. The bastard, the bad guy, the black sheep of the family. Integrate the evil. In integrate the evil. The shadow. The bastard. The bad guy. The black sheep of the family. The shadow. Everybody has a shadow. Because without the shadow, the can't be the person is scary because he is like the earthquakes or better and still he's like the ocean see the ocean on a lovely sunny day you can say oh isn't that gorgeous and you can go into it and relax and float around but boy when the storm comes does that thing get mad <laughs> terrifying so there is in us the ocean, you see. And Jung felt that the whole point was to bring the two together by a kind of fantastic honesty to penetrate one's own motivations to the depths. And it's in my darkest hours that a lot of people can't comprehend, you were there, you know, I'm going to live life, I'm going to live my days. How did you get from, I don't know if I'm going to come out of this battle, I don't know if I'm going to come home, how did you get from the darkest places to the brightest places? Sam Harris said to me, you talk about combat as your fondest memories. The best thing that's happened in your life, the high point in your life, which is all true. And he said, but then you talk about war being awful. So, which one is it? I said to him, I said, have you ever known anyone 
that has had cancer, terminal cancer, and made it through. Have you ever known anyone that that's happened? And he's like, yes. And I said, when you talk to them, many times they say, I'm glad that this happened to me. Number one, because it proved I could take it. Number two, it's better me than one of my kids. And number three, now that I know how dark it can get, I know how dark it can get. Now that I know how dark it can get, I truly appreciate the light in the world. Now that I know how dark it can get, I know how dark it can get. Now that I know how dark it can get, I truly appreciate the light in the world. That's what combat is and was for me. That's what it was. It was dark and horrible, and I wouldn't wish it on anyone, just like you wouldn't wish cancer on anyone. But if I can give them a little knowledge, a little bit of a glimpse into what it is, when you said that, people are clapping because they get to see a little bit of it. They go home tonight and they think, oh, what about that girl? What about that girl? She's fighting. She's living. And I'm gonna live too. And I'm gonna live too. Now that I know how dark it can get, I know how dark it can get. One wish 
to think of it that one, that way, one could say that they were two battling. But they had the same father, and they are one. And they are one. Battling himself out of loyalty, out of honor. And they are one. Battling himself, doing himself much harm. But that's the tragic sense. As I say, life begins, and that's the first thing the eye sees. Life eating itself, killing. But that's life. And the reconciliation of consciousness, which revolts from this, to that, and its affirmation, that is the song of mythology. It has been. It's the song of the religion. And with that little affirmative theme, the affirmation of life and it, I would say we have the key to the hopping up, the stepping up, the invigorating of life, which has been the function, actually, the first function of mythology from the time the old cavemen asked the bear to give his body to their life.
confidence and momentum with each good decision that you make from here on out. You can do it. You can do it. Anyone can do it. Anyone can do it. We live in unique times. We live in one of the rarest times in human history where you can choose almost all of the input that comes your way. Whether it's the movies that you watch, the books you read, the podcasts you listen to, you can choose to be inspired. Do that. Do that. Do, do, do that. Do, 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 do that. Do that. Be the hero. Be the hero. Be, 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 be the hero. Of your own movie. You have to be the hero of your own story. story. You have to be the hero of your own story. You have to be the hero of your own story. And you can do that. didactic little story there are these two guys sitting together in a bar in the remote alaskan wilderness one of the guys is religious the other's an atheist and the two are arguing about the existence of god with that special intensity that comes after about the fourth beer and the atheist says look it's not like i don't have actual reasons for not believing in god it's not like i haven't ever experimented with the whole god and prayer thing Just last month, I got caught away from camp in that terrible blizzard, and I was totally lost, and I couldn't see a thing, and it was 50 below. And so I tried it. I fell to my knees in the snow and cried out, oh God, if there is a God, I'm lost in this blizzard, and I'm going to die if you don't help me. And now, in the bar, the religious guy looks at the atheist all puzzled. Well, then you must believe now, he says. After all, here you are alive the atheist just rolls his eyes no man all that was was a couple eskimos happened to come wandering by and they showed me the way back to camp it's easy to run the story through a kind of standard liberal arts analysis the exact same experience can mean two totally different things to two different people given those people's two different belief templates and two different ways of constructing meaning from experience
because we prize tolerance and diversity of belief. Nowhere in our liberal arts analysis do we want to claim that one guy's interpretation is true and the other guy's is false or bad. Which is fine, except we also never end up talking about just where these individual templates and beliefs come from. Meaning where they come from inside the two guys. As if a person's most basic orientation toward the world and the meaning of his experience were somehow just hardwired, like height or shoe size or automatically absorbed from the culture, like language. As if how we construct meaning were not actually a matter of personal, intentional choice. Plus there's the matter of arrogance. The non-religious guy is so totally certain in his dismissal of the possibility that the passing Eskimos had anything to do with his prayer for help. True, there are plenty of religious people who seem arrogantly certain of their own interpretations too. They're probably even more repulsive than atheists. At least to most of us. But religious dogmatist problem is exactly the same as the story's unbeliever. Blind certainty. A closed-mindedness that amounts to an imprisonment so total that the prisoner doesn't even know he's locked up. The point here is that I think this is one part of what teaching me how to think is really supposed to mean to be just a little less arrogant to have just a little critical awareness about myself and my certainties because a huge percentage of stuff that I tend to be automatically certain of is it turns out Totally wrong and deluded. I have learned this the hard way, as I predict you graduates will too. Meaning from experience. Meaning from experience. Experience. Meaning from experience. from experience. We've discussed the web from three points of view as an analogy of the selective operation of our senses and mind, whereby certain things in the world are picked out as significant according to certain game rules. The game that we are playing mostly is the survival game. That is to say, the game ought to go on. play the survival game has a kind of element in it which makes it difficult 
because we tend to say the first rule of this game is that it's serious. And that messes the whole thing up. So you have to watch out, in other words, when you play for contradictory game rules, self-contradictory game rules. Because if you get mixed up into them, the game ceases to be worth the candle. You start straining at doing something, then it just isn't worth it. Then the second thing that we observed was the web as an analogy of mutual interdependence. We could call it the idea that all existence is relative, that all existence is transaction. The transaction being typically exemplified by, say, the operation of buying and selling, in which there can be no buying without somebody selling, and there can be no selling without somebody else buying. That kind of interdependence of the inside going together with the outside. What is in you going together with what is outside you is absolutely fundamental to existence. It is existence. Existence is relativity. Existence is relativity. Existence is relativity. What is in you going together with what is outside you is absolutely fundamental to existence. It is existence. Existence is relativity. Existence is relativity. Existence is relativity. Then we explored the web as a trap. The spider's web. Won't you come into my parlor, said the spider to the fly. And we saw what you look at all of life from the point of view that it is original selfishness and original hunger. And we found that if you take that point of view to its ultimate extreme, it dissolves. And it isn't so bad after all. Shakespeare says, it is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. When it's put that way, it doesn't seem so bad after all. <laughs> what is in you going together with what is outside you is absolutely fundamental to existence. It is existence. Existence is relativity. Existence is relativity. Existence is relativity. What is in you going together with what is outside you is absolutely fundamental to existence. It is existence. Existence is relativity. Existence is relativity. Existence is relativity. I remember that I had a Zen master friend who wrote a letter to a friend of mine which was passed on to me. This friend of mine was aspiring to be a writer and he was trying to write novels that would put across Buddhism to people. Sugar the pill. And my Zen master friend didn't approve of this at all. He said, don't write any story to people. Write it to the great sky. Because all the real masters of literature, especially novelists and storytellers, our great masters of nonsense. Think of Lewis Carroll. You can uh, use Lewis Carroll, and he did use Alice in Wonderland, as a Zen textbook. It was brillig and the slithy toes that gyre and gimble in the wave. That's Zen. I had a discussion with a great master in Japan. We were talking about the various people who are working to translate the Zen books into English. He said, that's a waste of time. If you really understand Zen, he said, you can use any book. You could use the Bible. You could use Alice in Wonderland. You could use the dictionary. Because, he said, the sound of the rain needs no translation. The sound of the rain needs no translation. The sound of the rain needs no translation. The sound of the rain needs no translation.
It is the banana leaf that speaks of it first. You see, that's the point. And all the talk in the world doesn't get it unless you listen to the talk in a new way. The sound of the rain needs no translation. 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 this stuff already. It's been codified as myths, proverbs, cliches, epigrams, parables. The skeleton of every great story. What has meaning? And what doesn't? What has meaning? And what doesn't? You get the conscious of the side. What has meaning? 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 The whole trick is keeping the truth up front in daily consciousness. Worship power end up feeling weak and afraid. And you will need ever more power over others to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. Look, the insidious thing about these forms of worship is not that they're evil or sinful. It is that they are unconscious. They are default settings. 
They're the kind of worship you just gradually slip into. Day after day, getting more and more selective about what you see and how you measure value without ever being fully aware that that's what you're doing. And the so-called real world will not discourage you from operating on your default settings. Because the so-called real world of men and money and power comes merrily along on the fuel of fear and anger and frustration and craving and the worship of self. Our own present culture has harnessed these forces in ways that have yielded extraordinary wealth and comfort and personal freedom. The freedom all to be lords of our own tiny skull-sized kingdoms. Alone at the center of all creation. This kind of freedom has much to recommend it. But of course there are all different kinds of freedom. And the kind that is most precious you will not hear much talked about much in the great outside world of wanting and achieving and displaying. The really important kind of freedom involves attention and awareness and discipline. And being able truly to care about other people and to sacrifice for them over and over. In myriad, heady little unsexy ways. Every day. That is real freedom. That is being educated and understanding how to think. The alternative is unconsciousness, the default setting, the rat race, the constant gnawing sense of having had and lost some infinite thing. I know that this stuff probably doesn't sound fun and breezy or grandly inspirational the way a commencement speech is supposed to sound. What it is, as far as I can see, is the capital T truth with a whole lot of rhetorical niceties stripped away. You are, of course, free to think of it whatever you wish. But please don't just dismiss it as some finger-wagging Dr. Laura sermon. None of this stuff is really about morality or religion or dogma or big fancy questions of life after death. The capital T truth is about life before death. It is about the real value of a real education which has almost nothing to do with knowledge and everything to do with simple awareness. Awareness of what is so real and essential, so hidden in plain sight all around us all the time, that we have to keep reminding ourselves over and over, this is water. 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 It is unimaginably hard to do this. To stay conscious and alive in the adult world. Day in and day out. Which means yet another grand cliche turns out to be true. Your education really is the job of a lifetime. And it commences now. What has meaning? And what doesn't? What has meaning? And what doesn't? You get to consciously decide what has meaning.